pleasure to be here. I'd, I said to the organizer, Jean, my very good friend Jean-Louis Taboul, that, that this should have probably been the first lecture because I'm going to overview everything. But this is when it's going to be. So what you've already heard is a lot of this, but in isolation. I'm going to pull it all together. These are my conflicts of interest. They have nothing to do with what I'm going to talk about today. The medical world has discovered, to my surprise, that emergent intubation of patients for respiratory failure causes cardiovascular compromise. I thought we knew that 50 years ago. But as you can see, in a 29 country massive thing, there was over all total 50% of the patients have cardiovascular compromise. And at the University of Pittsburgh, if we do an emergent intubation, 50% of the patients within after one hour still have a mean arterial pressure less than 60 after intubation. So this is a real phenomenon. Now, what they also show, and I have no idea why they did this, is they said that if you give 500 mLs of fluid, it didn't help. I hope after my talk you'll understand that that was a really stupid thing to do for every single patient, okay? But let's go through this, okay? There is, however, a weak association between giving uh, sympathetolytic agents such as Profofol, and there you're getting more into the issue of what's really going on, and that has to do with vasomotor tone. Well, there are three fundamental principles which I'm going to describe and that underlie everything else. The first one is that spontaneous ventilation is exercise. It's exercise in every sense of the word. It uses skeletal muscle, it's voluntary, and it can produce a lot of carbon dioxide and use a lot of oxygen. Spontaneous ventilation, which is the way we normally breathe, will increase the preload of both the right and the left ventricle and will impede left ventricular afterload and positive pressure ventilation does the exact opposite. If you know those things and you understand the mechanism behind it, then you know everything I'm going to talk about. So let's talk about the first. <clears throat> uh, Michelle OBA years ago at McGill induced tamponade in an animal model by putting oil into the heart and around the heart, pericardium, and just watched what happened as it was breathing spontaneously. And as you can see in this example over time, that at 30 minutes in, 60 minutes in, the respiratory rate increased because that's the response to shock. And the activity breathing went on, but by 140 minutes, the electrical activity, the diaphragm was screaming, but the transdiaphragmatic pressure was falling. Patients die, respiratory failure deaths, and then secondarily cardiovascular. That's why patients die at four in the morning when they have heart failure they die a cardiovascular death from a respiratory arrest. And you see it every day. It is exercise. And the number of papers over the years that have shown that breathing is exercise is too numerous to count. In this slide, I only went to 2001. Uh, in a recent chapter I wrote, we went up to recently, they all show the exact same thing. The thing I like were some of the earlier papers by Zeb Masenafar and Amal Jabran. What he did, Zeb, is he measured gut blood flow. And he said that a normal pH of the gut is whatever. And then he measured it after a weaning trial in patients with COPD. And what he found was that if you were successful at weaning, that your gut didn't become ischemic as measured by the pH of a tonometer. But then he looked at patients of the same population who failed. And interestingly, they had a lower pH to start with, statistically significant, but it wasn't abnormal. But when they failed in just one hour, their gut pH was well below that we see in circulatory shock. If I cannot increase my cardiac output to meet the metabolic demands of the exercising muscles, I must pull blood flow away from the rest of the organs. Furthermore, Amal Gibran said, if this is true, I should expect the mixed venous oxygen saturation to fall and continuously fall because the cardiac output can increase to meet the increased metabolic demands of breathing. And as you can see, weaning successes, the SVO2 didn't fall. But look at the weaning failure. The mean value was 50%. I guarantee you there is ischemic tissue at that time. Forcing a person to breathe spontaneously when they can't is a really good way of killing them. 
potentially the reason why all of the mechanical weaning parameters that we use are so poor at predicting cardiovascular, uh, predicting weaning successes because none of them measure cardiovascular reserve. And I published that 23 years ago, and it's still true today. It's the big fish. And that's a 23-inch trout that I caught on a fly, and yes, I did release it. Okay. If weaning is exercise, I can use it as a cardiac stimulation test. And the number of studies that have shown that weaning can unmask cardiovascular insufficiency is again too numerous to count. My favorite is one from Maurice Lemaire many years ago with Jean-Louis Taboul. And what they did is they looked at patients with COPD, and this is an example of one of them, and this is the slide that Maurice Lemaire used in his original presentation at the ATS, and after the meeting he handed me the slide. It's mine. And I took a copy of it here, so you're seeing the original data. And what he showed was that a baseline, before he put the patient in the ventilator, you can see that the pulmonary artery occlusion pressure, I don't know, you can see this arrow? Can you see the arrow? Yes or no? Okay. This is your pulmonary artery occlusion pressure. It's about 12 to 18. Esophageal pressure, which is measured here, is about 3, which is normal in a supine patient. The heart's on top of the esophagus, and the pressure is slightly higher. With spontaneous breathing, the first thing you see is the end expiratory esophageal pressure is negative, which happens because when you're breathing, you hyperinflate and hold your lungs at big volume. Everyone does it with exercise. When you exercise, you increase your lung volume. It's part of your normal response. But look at these massive negative swings in esophageal pressure. The pulmonary artery occlusion pressure rose to above 40. And that since the pleural pressure was lower, this is the true pressure in the capillaries. At nine minutes, the, the breathing was agonal and the pressure is now 50. And I asked Francois, what did you do at this point right here? And he responded, I put the patient back on the ventilator or he would have died. Said in another way, this is not subtle. When you try to do a spontaneous breathing trial, patients will fail very quickly. The reason we do spontaneous breathing trials is because they have absolutely no idea if a patient could breathe on their own. So we simply throw them in the swimming pool and see if they can swim. If they can't swim and they drown, we pull them out from under the water. We say, I'll throw them in the swimming pool again tomorrow. We are doing that still today. Okay. What we're really doing is liberating from mechanical ventilation. <clears throat> so now let's leave exercise and ask, why does this occur? There are two concepts here that come with heart-lung interactions. The first is we change lung volumes. With every breath, we increase the lung volume from some resting volume, functional residual capacity, to a tidal volume back and forth. However, with positive pressure breathing, the pressure rises, and in spontaneous breathing, the pressure falls. But in both cases, lung volumes increase. So the hemodynamic effects of mechanical ventilation and spontaneous ventilation are not, are not primarily due the differences between the two are not primarily due to changes in lung volume, which are the same in everyone, but they're due to the changes in intrathoracic pressure and the energy necessary to create those changes. But since everyone has changes in lung volume, and lung volumes are a big deal, let's look at that first. <clears throat> the lung is phenomenally innervated with parasympathetic and sympathetic tone, and under normal situations, when you breathe in spontaneously, you get a vagal withdrawal, and this causes respiratory sinus arrhythmia. This is a nice thing to have because it shows that you're healthy. Loss of respiratory sinus arrhythmia occurs with stress and with diabetics. Okay. But on the other hand, the lungs, when they increase and decrease their volume, change their vascular resistance. And that's due to the fact that the, if the alveolar PaO2, big A, or pH fall, then these patients will have constriction of their pulmonary vasculature, and that's called hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. Now let's stop for a second. If I take any other vascular bed except the kidney, and I make its hypoxemic, what does it do? It dilates. Yes? They dilate if they're ischemic. The lung constricts. And it does it to match ventilation to perfusion, and it uses different receptors to do that. So let's look at now the pulmonary circulation. In the pulmonary circulation, your arteries, arterioles, venules, and pulmonary veins all exist in the interstitium, and they're surrounded by an, uh, an extra alveolar pressure, which is pretty close to pleural pressure. And that little area in the lung, 
that is where the capillaries are, is surrounded by alveoli, and they're having alveolar pressure. So we have alveolar vessels sensing alveolar pressure as their surrounding pressure, and extra alveolar vessels that sense pleural pressure. And I will remind you that the difference between alveolar pressure and pleural pressure is transpulmonary pressure, which is the distending pressure of the lung. For the lung volume to increase, transpulmonary pressure must increase. And you should remember that from basic physiology. So we can look at pulmonary vascular resistance from residual volume, RV, to resting volume, to total lung capacity in a normal person. And like many things in life, it's a U-shaped curve with the least pulmonary vascular resistance occurring at FRC. But the reason why pulmonary vascular resistance increases at the extremes is different. For the alveolar vessels, they don't have any vasomotor tone at all. They're just capillaries. But as their transpulmonary pressure increases, i.e. the lung volume gets bigger, transpulmonary pressure exceeds pulmonary venous pressure and the vessels spontaneously collapse, decreasing their cross-sectional area, increasing pulmonary vascular resistance. But what happens when lung volumes are small? As the lung volume gets smaller and smaller, terminal airways collapse, right, the closing pressure, and the alveola on the other side have their oxygen absorbed and the large vessels, by the process of hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction, occlude. And so I get pulmonary vasoconstriction with hypoinflation, and I get overdistension with hyperinflation. The original study was by Hakim. It was very nicely done. They said if you decrease below uh, FRC, the collapse causes hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction. And Canada from Bill Sibyl's lab did a really pretty study in which he took animal model and half of them, he caused a lake acid pulmonary edema into the one lung and not in the other. And then the other half, he switched it. So half it was the right and half it was the left. But he had both lungs so he could look at the flow. And what he did is in the lung, group that was injured, he measured their pulmonary vascular resistance. He measured a lot, but this is all I'm going to show you. And what you can see is the pulmonary vascular resistance was really high. And when he added five of PEEP, the pulmonary vascular resistance fell. This is almost assuredly due to reversing hypoxic pulmonary vasoconstriction by recruiting collapsed lung. And it stayed about stable until about 10, and then it slowly went up to 15 uh, millimeters of mercury PEEP. He reported this in millimeters of mercury. If you look at the normal lung, you can see its pulmonary vascular resistance is really low because it's a normal lung. And note that there was a slight decrease in pulmonary vascular resistance when you go from zero to five. What is the optimal resting peep of a person? I don't know. It's probably two to five, somewhere in that range. But all you're doing is reversing microatelectasis. But after that, pulmonary vascular resistance in the healthy lung rose. But look, there is no difference between a sick lung and a healthy lung, once you overinflate them, they will have the same increase in pulmonary vascular resistance. So the optimal peak should be that which recruits the lung but doesn't overdistend it. That's a lot harder to do than it is to say. Okay? But in that regard, as I showed yesterday, Peter Suter, when looking at the maximal compliance, we can talk about the fact that cardiac alpha progressively does decreased as the peak went up, we're going to that in a second. But the most important part was that the optimal peak had a minimal amount of hyperinflation because you had the best dead space decrease, which is what you want. That's, that's cardiovascular. If I have low dead space, my entitled CO2 is higher. I'm blowing out more CO2 because I'm perfusing the alveoli. So increases in lung volume collapse the alveoli, as Roy Brower showed. And this is important because hyperinflation is really common. Uh, Shelley Magder showed you Pepe and Marini's paper. The original data was done by Bergman, in which he showed that hyperinflation, because you don't have enough time for exhalation, causes you to have increases in pulmonary vascular resistance. And the way this works is very straightforward. You breathe in positively, but you passively exhale. And you exhale based on the time constant of the resistance and the compliance, the higher the resistance or the lower the compliance, the higher the compliance, the longer it takes to breathe out. Okay? So what they showed was that if you hyperinflate and don't have enough time to breathe out, you rapidly reach a new equilibrium point. So let's talk about the patient that you emergently intubated. They will rapidly increase their lung volume, and by the third breath, 
they're already hyperinflated. By the time you're securing the endotracheal tube, because you just intubated, they already are hyperinflated. It's not 15 minutes later, it's right then and there. You already have done that if you've given them too large a tidal volume. They don't explode because they'll get to a higher level of stiffer lung, lower compliance, and larger size airway, but they'll reach it at a hyperinflated lung with increasing pulmonary vascular resistance. And when Pepe and Marini described this in uh, their article in 1982, it had to be called a clinical commentary because the reviewers said, we already know this is true, but no one's aware of it. So please remind us that there is such a thing as hyperinflation induced decreases in blood flow and then when you pop them off peep or off the ventilator and allow the lungs to deflate, the venous return increases. Okay? So, when the lungs expand, with spontaneous breathing or positive pressure breathing, the chest wall goes out, the diaphragm descends, but the heart is trapped in the cardiac fossa and gets compressed. And this is true in asthma and it's true with too much peep. And then this very nice study that was done years ago in Seattle, they looked at a patient with expiration and inspiration on zero and then 10 centimeters of water peep. And look what happens to the lung, the heart volume between ZEEP and 10 of peep. It's not subtle. You decrease the preload, the volume in the ventricle goes down. So let's now talk about why that happens independent of lung volume. Let's talk about intrathoracic pressure. Okay. To accept this, though, you have to accept the following hypothesis. The hypothesis is that the heart is in the chest. Do you accept that? Yes or no? Good. Because everything makes sense then. The heart is in the chest, a pressure chamber inside a pressure chamber and thus increases and decreases in intrathoracic pressure must affect the pressure gradient for venous return to the heart and left ventricular ejection independent of the heart itself. Right? Yes? It has to. So let's look at this. As you saw from Shelley Magner and others about venous return, if I were to look at ventricular function curve and increase right atrial pressure as Guyton did, I'm sorry, as Starling did, you can get an increase in stroke volume and blood flow with fluid loading artifactually with a pump. But using the exact same right atrial pressure, if you only look at venous return, you see that as you increase right atrial pressure, you decrease venous return, but as you decrease right atrial pressure, the pressure gradient grows up and you have more flow, and that's your venous return curve. And it follows that you and I and our patients have one and only one right atrial pressure and cardiac output we can have which is a function of ventricular pump function, blood volume, and blood flow distribution. Okay? But the heart is in the chest, and intrathoracic pressure is going to change that. This is a very important slide. This slide explains what Shelley said yesterday, and these are the data that we use to defend that statement. In a study I did many years ago, I think this is, um, what was it, 40 years ago now, isn't that depressing? Spontaneous breathing decreases pleural pressure. CVP goes down, stroke volume goes up. So I get a fall in CVP, increase in cardiac output. Positive pressure does the opposite. So spontaneous breathing, I get a fall in CVP. Cardiac output goes up, no change in function. That's referred to as a thoracic pump, and that's why cardiac output is higher with uh, spontaneous breathing. And if you have an occluded breath, this is normal breath, you get massive increases in volume, as you can see here. And this is what happens with obstructive apnea. It doesn't get bigger because you have a pericardium that limits the right ventricle. Increases in spontaneous breathing are going to cause pulmonary edema. And we know that from multiple studies that have been done. Now let's go the other way. Increases in intrathoracic pressure will cause the CVP to rise but the cardiac output to fall. What do you do? Well, oftentimes you give fluids. And this is the major cause is proposed in a normal person who's hypovolemic. If you intubate a hypovolemic patient, they'll become hypotensive because of the decrease in venous return. What you do is you give them fluids. But watch, now extubate them. When you do that, they'll be volume overloaded because you'll be on that higher curve. That's why you make a patient who you're going to extubate slightly hypovolemic before extubation. And this was nicely shown by Antoine Villarbron, 
that you first have a decrease in venous, return, venous flow and then arterial flow. The larger the tidal volume, the more the blood leaves the chest and the more that comes in. We thought that if this was true, we'd do an inspiratory hold and see the venous return fall during a spontaneous breath. But regrettably, when we did it with Paul Vandenberg in, uh, for his PhD thesis uh, over uh, 20 years ago, we found that there was no relationship. I hate it when that's the case. Michael, and can I ask you to wrap up? I will then. Yeah. And the reason for that, and I'll stop with this, is that with positive pressure breathing, you increase intra-abdominal pressure under normal conditions. And that causes the mean systemic pressure to rise. And because of that, under normal conditions, spontaneous breathing is, uh, positive pressure breathing is, has mimics. But if you have a person who's got a tense abdomen and you open their belly during surgery, they will immediately go into cardiovascular collapse because you lose that abdominal stenting. And with that, I'll stop and tell you thank you very much for your attention. Bye-bye.